can I save it as a new name? Yeah. Because it's not in Finnish anymore. I tried to read Finnish. Okay, I'm going to call it you know, David. Save it on my flash memory stick and send it to you so you have a copy of the final version. How's that sound? Sure. You are really expert at all this. This is like all the presentations. Um, I do it a lot. I do it a lot. So, yeah. version just says updated. The one you want to post here, it'll just say Oakley updated. So you, you want to get it, get it up? To, oh, hang it's, on. it's on. We have it up. But I mean, oh, do you want to put it up on the web, you're saying? Um, Can you put that up no, there? No, I was going to suggest let's pair up this. Please touch the screen. Oh, okay, so, so this is, yes. And it's the PC. Yes, you're right. And it's going to pair up, and then you can just um, open it up and in the usual way. Yeah, it's um, up. We have it at the top. It's, it's ready. Yeah. Okay. We, we have separated the machine up. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> well, that's doing that. I'm going to begin to gently interrupt. Yeah. Otherwise. As you know, <laughs> the best time is right for us, but sometimes not. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wake them up. Yeah, I'll I don't know how, yeah, I don't know how much you move around, but you could either keep it on here or yeah, go for it. So now you're being recorded. Is it? Is this live? On? It is on. It's All right. Podcast is just being recorded. Okay, we're at ten two. <clears throat> So we've got our timer set for 20, okay, brilliant. right, like that? So if we get started, we're all set, okay. Mm. <clears throat> Remember, after we're done, the other room's and we'll come back here for the final one. The other room has the three breakouts. This room has one, a workshop, which 
to have you. Well, you'll be able to see better from over there, actually. Or you could sit in the front row, too. Is there anyone sitting there? Yeah. Okay. So why don't you just take that one, I think, yeah. That's probably best. And then I'll come up at the end and just do question things. And I'll hand you the microphone. I have the microphone. I'll hand you the microphone. Okay. Oh. They're recording it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. You're right. Yeah. They can hear you. Okay. I think I'm better. It's better for me to sit sitting there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that way you can cue me better. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for having us on the line. We're very pleased to be able to introduce you to Curtis Strong and Mimi Lee, who are going to be doing their talk. Um, they're talking about stepping into life change and new measures the impact of this and open education. You got your water there. You want a cup? <laughs> Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, Wow, I didn't even say it twice. Usually I have to say it twice. <laughs> As you notice, my voice is going on me a little bit here. I flew in from Finland this morning. I was presenting there at this time yesterday in Tempere and, flew, and woke up at 3 a.m. to take a bus to come join you. So actually, I didn't wake up. I didn't go to bed. So um, my colleague Mimi Lee and I are going to talk about MOOCs and open education and some of the research we've been doing. Uh, I've got my timer set at 20 minutes. So uh, at the end of 20 minutes, we're going to give away seven, um, seven books of my new book, called Adding Some Tech Variety, which all of you can get for free if you go to techvariety.com. You can download the new book for free. There's no H in tech. I've made it a free book and so forth. And Mimi and I are working on a book on MOOCs and open education. And Amy is in the audience somewhere here. She's writing a chapter for us uh, with Rutledge. So um, we don't have the chapters in yet, or we talk about that. We're going we're to talk about life change here in this particular talk. Uh, and hopefully, we'll have some inspiring questions from all of you. And you'll get a free book if you one of these paper ones. And um, so we should probably get started since it's about the 19 minutes here. So stepping into life change, <laughs> not stepping into quicksand or doggy do, or stepping into life change, a new measure of the impact of MOOCs in open education. And you see some of the people here from India, Netherlands, and Spain taking a MOOC from UPenn, and Professor Peter Strzok teaching 50,000 students around the world in mythology. And you know, that actually, where your son, I think, goes to school at, at UPenn. It's, you know, it's one of the leaders in the field, you, uh, in the US, anyhow. Um, audience poll, how many of you remember what you were doing when 9-11 happened? How many of you remember 4-11? One of you, Fred does. What's happening in 4-11? Two days before my bank. Oh, well, OK. <laughs> <clears throat> On April 4, 2001, Charles Best announced that education should be free. I sent him my resume that night. I, I spoofed it up, sent it off to him, or spiced it up, I should say. He never returned my call, never returned the email. I don't know why. <laughs> but I was interested in this phenomenon back in 2001. We were lucky, and, and Mimi and I, in collecting data from MIT. So we're going to give you some data and show what uh, people are doing with MIT Open Courseware since that time, as well as taking a MOOC. My, uh, I did the first MOOC with Blackboard uh, on. Um, teaching online, and we analyzed some of that data as well. But Charles Best said, hey, this is bigger than MIT. You all should be jumping in on this. This is a unique phenomenon, and this is, these are unique times. And so um, he's trying to look at how can we raise the quality of learning and education. My second question here, it said polling question one earlier. This is another polling question one, should say two. Has learning technology ever transformed your life? Raise your hand. How about in the past year? OK. Changed my life. I was a board CPA and corporate controller, but I escaped the cube farms. This was my first computer, by the way. That was a laptop computer, mobile, weighed 40 pounds, US pounds. Flash uh, zip, you know, the floppy disk held 48K of memory. That's it. You know, 2,500 bucks. My boss said, what would someone need a personal computer for? But that's another story. We were true blue IBM mainframe all the way. Uh, and we went under after I went off to grad school. But I escaped the cube farms through TV and correspondence. I know TV and correspondence wasn't as good as face-to-face -face for me, but, I, but it changed my life. And I think some of us are looking at, is MOOCs better than 
face to face or not, or people are dropping out, but lives are changing despite whatever we're calling dropouts within all that. So let's fast forward 25 years, and today, as Fred, he's, someone said, hey, a copy of my World is Open book. In that book, I point out anyone can learn anything from anyone else at any time. And the kids today have technology wrapped all around them, as you can see there. Um, different technologies. We do, too. <coughs> Everybody on the plane with me today was checking things <coughs> immediately as we got off. The old technology, prehistoric Googling. Some of you remember that, right? Raise your hands. You're certifiably old. Okay. <coughs> New technologies that enable us to access, filter, share information. You know, the world's become more visual, more collaborative, more open, more online, more blended, more ubiquitous, more comfortable. Learning is changing in many ways. And we're going to talk about open. Whether we're talking about 80-year-old gentlemen getting their degree finally, or women in the rainforest in wheelchairs learning online from the University of the People. This guy's learning from Western Governors University. This Yak Herder from Tibet learning from Open Yale. Life's changing for many people out there. We, the press tends to ignore that. The press doesn't talk about life change at all. They're only looking at one simple number that doesn't really mean a whole lot. Um, now, what, what's happening? I'm going to give you some current news. My friend Chuck Severance is doing a MOOC right now on programming for everyone, trying to get high school teachers to learn how to program. This guy's the guy with the open source tattoo who built Sakai, if you've heard of Sakai Foundation. He uh, traveled to Barcelona, met his students, traveled to Seoul, Korea, met his students, traveled to Manila, Melbourne. He travels the world meeting his students. University of London has a course on research methods right now. June 18th, announcement from Oregon State, we're going to offer a PD MOOC for teachers. I think MOOCs, particular professional development MOOCs, theory-driven MOOCs, remedial MOOCs, make a lot of sense. You know, teachers don't have to come on campus then for this, or dentists, or doctors, or whatever. In fact, June 17th, there was an announcement that, um, uh, I got an email anyhow, announcing a website uh, called um, OEDB.org. It's an open education database. And they were trying to index MOOCs, and I, I wrote to them, it's, it's, a, it's a voluntary base. This is not a corporate or a company doing this. They've been working on this for a number of years, creating an, uh, exploring open courses, free, you know, whether it's free art classes, humanities classes, biology classes, or whatever. Of course, the Sailor Foundation's doing this too, out of DC. Uh, this woman here is taking a short MOOC. There's a couple of Russian entrepreneurs creating a, a new company that's um, that's trying to challenge traditional um, instruction by creating short, pithy kinds of MOOCs. Uh, and um, you know, whether that's going to take off or not, I'm not, not quite sure. That was May, May 5th, 2014. And I'm missing the name of the company, unfortunately. And maybe somebody can help me out and look that up. Uh, October 31st, 2013, Sir John Daniels says, let's make an open education resource university where you can sign up for any class you want. But if you want course credit, if you want uh, certificates, then you pay. So it's a pay for the, you know, there's a, there's a lot of business models here. As a former accountant, I've come up with 15 business models for MOOCs. I'm not going to go through all 15, but one of them is to pay for certificates, pay for the assessments. And I'm <clears throat> at about two minutes left before I switch over to Mimi here. Uh, in Rwanda, they have a set of MOOCs up online, or they're taking, repurposing MOOCs for, uh, they're repurposing MOOCs to get kids hybrid programs. So in Rwanda, they're taking open education courses, contents, and creating courses out of them. But there are problems, many problems, despite all the hype, despite all the, the positive successes, despite all the life change. We, we hear about the University of Edinburgh, and we hear about Duke University, we hear about MIT and Harvard, and the dropout rates, but not everyone's there to finish the course. They're there to learn a little bit, to learn to find out what online learning's like. We hear about lack of engagement. Well, not everybody's there actually to take that course. They just you know, thought they might browse it like being in a library. You know, I think MOOCs are more like being in a, exposed to a library than being in a course. If we, we never look at how many people finish reading the book or that they opened up. We don't give that, the, the media never reports that kind of thing. But we do open up minds when they open up books. We open up minds, we open up doors. We give people possibilities for life change. There's some data showing that, yes, the majority of men, young people uh, with a bachelor's degree are the majority taking MOOCs. You know, people already coming in with degrees. This little infographic statistic came out uh, about a month and a half ago. So that's a problem. Another problem is the issue of impact. You know, where are we impacting? Are we impacting just people in North America and the UK? Are we offering, you know, are we impacting people, in particular, if you look at this slide, uh, the uh, <clears throat> percent of people having degrees already taking courses in North Africa is pretty large. We're not getting, you know, people in, in, in parts of the world that we would like to get exposure to uh, taking these MOOCs, so the impact issues. We're not impacting the underprivileged. Two-thirds of people taking Coursera courses 
are coming from the developed world, not the, underdeve not the undeveloped world or underdeveloped world. Number five, assessment and credentialing issues regarding MOOCs. Are, they real, are we going to have, are we actually going to have some kind of um, uh, certificate or course credit or a program uh, degree or something else or badges or something like that? So issues of assessment and, and credentialing are also pervasive. Lack of feedback. Now, of course, Sarah's forming learning hubs to meet with other people, chat with other people, whether you're living in Kenya or Argentina or Venezuela or other parts of the world. You have a learning hub to come meet other folks in New York City or, or in London here. And localization of content. Of course, Sarah just announced that they're going to have a set of people localize contents. Now, we studied, Mimi and I a long time ago studied the OOPS project out of Taiwan where they were translating MIT contents free to the world in Chinese. Of course, Sarah just picked up on this notion. They're a for-profit taking advantage of people volunteering their time to make Coursera a more profitable company. Think about that. Um, so that's a, that's a big issue. This guy from Korea says we need more C, OC MOOCs, one culture, one culture MOOCs. So we have all Koreans around the world, all expats around the world, taking content that's not in English or dominated in English but in Korean. He also said we need human MOOCs, H MOOCs, but I'm not sure what he means by that. And we need to stop having the government shut down the MOOCs for people in Syria. One day you talk about a guy in Syria whose life changed through MOOCs, and the next day the U.S. government shuts down the spigot and don't, doesn't allow courses going to Cuba, Iran, Syria, and so forth. So there's some serious issues around all these MOOCs. This guy did get access to it eventually. There was a lot of uh, hoopla about that. But on the other hand, there's life change. There's people at Wellesley College, this guy in particular, who has a MOOC. He says, in my MOOC on Alexander the Great, students are inspired. Um, their, their lives are being changed. There's inspiration, passion, love of learning. We hear about Starbucks offering online courses. There's a lot of people serving you coffee at Starbucks whose lives are going to be changed, as the announcement last week, for free online education. And um, finally, this woman here in Afghanistan was announced last week that she's going to fly to the U.S. to he headline a conference for corporate trainers, and she's been learning online through digital education. And Elliot Maisie and the Maisie Institute decided to have her be the keynote of the conference, talking about how her life was changed and inspired. Uh, the Gates Foundation is doing research around MOOCs, in, uh, having uh, the researchers do short little videos of what their research says. I think we need student, learner, participant, videos about how their lives are changing. Anyways, we studied MIT OpenCourseWare, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, MIT OpenCourseWare is used around the world. Uh, we had mostly males over age 40, 50 percent. We had 1,400 completed surveys. They came from India, China, Brazil, Nigeria, Pakistan. They were mostly curious about the topic, interested in the topic, self-improvement, wanting to learn something, and so forth. Uh, more personal control. They're not looking to get a certificate, not looking to get a badge. They were learning science and math and foreign language and culture. They were looking for new skills, bettering their lives, helping society out. Credit bearing was way down the list. So again, the media is hyping this side, but people are looking to change society. They want to learn something new, want freedom, and so forth. Personal freedom, Carl Rogers, freedom to learn in psychology. Uh, fun, fantasy, choice, adventure. This is all in the new book. I have a, this is a book on, op, on motivation and retention online with 10 principles of motivation. This comes out in open courseware. This comes out in MOOCs, why people are involved in them. So Mimi's going to talk a bit about the qualitative side of things here and then switch it back to me at the very end. Mm -hmm. oh, I need to give you the microphone. Okay, so I was invited to um, conduct the analysis on the qualitative data of the MIT OpenCourseWare study that Kurt just has mentioned. Um, out of 43 item survey, um, there were 25 open-ended items, and we received 613 completed responses. So my task was to analyze those 613 responses and see what they are actually saying. So kind of um, a different focus than what Kurt has just mentioned. I'm more interested in um, how do we interpret the life change or what do I, what, how do we make sense of what's happening um, with MOOCs learners. And um, stepping back a little bit, I'm by, by training, I'm a 
quality researcher and more of a critical ethnographer. So I'm, I'm very interested in more micro-level um, issues. So you can imagine um, the challenge that I face looking at the survey items, which I don't usually do. I'm doing more, you know, I'm more of an interview and observation person. Um, but the whole idea of MOOCs and um, finding a way to um, understand the, the MOOCs learners in a way that is meaningful for me as a quality researcher was interesting enough, so I just took on the challenge. Um, I'm looking at culture and the identity of MOOC learners, and we are using mixed methods with a group of researchers. I'm using the word mixed methods in a loose term. In a way, it's not quantitative and qualitative mix, but more of qualitative research methods and um, two, two methods um, combined in, in the um, analysis. And there are four of us who are um, working. And um, so what we found out um, through this overall qualitative research analysis about MOOCs learners is that they have strong intrinsic motivation. Um, a lot of people said, this is for my own pleasure. That was focused and mentioned um, repeatedly. And emphasis on autonomy. Nobody helped me. They said it very proudly. You know, Nobody helped me. I did it on my own. Um, the fact that I didn't have anybody to help me seemed to be a source of pride for these um, learners. Love for creation and sharing. Um, membership of community and in the community with people of similar interests. So this is kind of a general idea of MOOC learners that um, we have noticed. Um, the challenge with this big data set was that, especially in this term, 43 items and um, 25 open-ended question items, there were possible overlaps between the open-ended questions, and I was not involved in making those um, questions. So when I was given the, the set of data, there were a lot of overlaps. And so there were connected responses across the questions. So out of 25 um, questions, if what we realize is some people don't answer um, when they say something about, okay, what was the challenge? What, didn't you not, what did you not like about your experience MOOCs? And they say something like, oh, everything was okay. And so if I look at that, the person didn't have any problem with you know, the MOOCs that they took. But along the line by, say, out of 25 questions, by question 23 or 24, when we ask, when the question asks, okay, do you have any advice or suggestions for future peop, uh, learners in MOOCs? They would have um, suggestions and advices that are very critical. And so there was a discrepancy between the, their, their answer in number one when they, when, when they were asked, do you have any things that you didn't like, which was no. And by you know, item 24, they had all these you know, ideas and advices for people who are planning to take uh, MOOCs. So we've noticed, and I've noticed that looking at um, these questions by item wouldn't give me a, a good um, or meaningful answer. So I've decided to um, analyze 25 items by participants. So instead of going you know, vertical, we decided to go across and treat um, each participant and 25 answers by each participant as a short interview. So um, treating um, as 76 for short interviews. Um, actually, there are 605 MIT course um, answers, and there were Blackboard um, questions, Blackboard data sets. So out of six, um, 764, there are only 605 MIT open course were interviews. So the challenge has been that I'm reading um, just because I don't have anything else to do, all 605 um, interviews as short interviews. And it's taking a lot of time. And I have, I have read all 605 answers. But um, it's been painstakingly you know, tedious um, work in terms of the, the um, speed. But it has been very meaningful because I get to um, 
see what people have said about their experiences in a meaningful way. So <coughs> this is a kind of a short description of we, um, there were, and another member of the four researcher group for us, one decided to use en vivo because she felt like, you know, it's, you know we have to do this quickly. We can't, we can't read all 605 uh, questions. So she's doing en vivo analysis. I'm doing manual analysis. So um, we are going to present um, the comparison between the same set of data but using two different um, ways of um, analyzing, which will be very interesting. And we are planning to uh, present it at ARA um, next year. Um, so the reason that we are doing this is importance of understanding complexities behind individual in in experiences and challenges with big data and need for multiple perspectives and methods in data analysis. So some of the findings that we have, um, at least I was able to come up with from my manual analysis, is the need to understand heterogeneity of MOOCs participants and complexity behind their motives for participation. And I'll uh, talk to you a little bit more about that. So for example, when you read, the, um, when you read their responses, it's clear that there are shared values. For example, some common shared values are sense of purpose, importance of control, pride as a self-motivated autonomous learner. But there are very diverse ways of pursuing these values that seem very shared. So that is what I mean by heterogeneity and complexity behind their, the data. So the di diverse ways of pursuing the values are manifested in contradicting ways. So even within the shared values, the way they are manifesting the values are very different and sometimes are contradicting. For example, about assessment and certifications, people have very different views about um, assessment and certification. So let me give you an example. So shared values, sense of purpose, importance of control, time and content, pride as self-motivated, learning as fun, share, sharing knowledge, sense of confidence, empowerment through peer recognition. So these are shared values. So complex manif manifestation of values, for example, assessment certificates and job improvement. So these are shared, assessment certificates and job improvement, they are important. That's the shared value. But how they are talking about it, if you read it um, by participant, is there are people who want to do better in their current job. And there are people who want to use MOOCs for changing and getting a new job. And there are people who are um, doing MOOCs for job related in a way that they are seeking promotion within the job. So they will all show up as they are taking MOOCs to improve their job. But as you can see, um, depending where they are, yeah, um, their ideas and perspectives or um, thoughts about assessment certificates are very different. So for example, people who want to do better in their current job want the freedom to choose with no evaluation, no certificates. They just want to do, uh, they want to take MOOCs and be able to do a little bit better in their current job. The, the fact that there is no evaluation or certificate, it's an attraction for them. If they want to change the job through their experience in MOOCs, <laughs> new skills on one's own time and pace with some form of assessment. So they want to take their um, work in MOOCs, go to a, a new job and say, hey, there's a certificate that I've taken all these courses from Stanford, Harvard. So this will you know, put me more competitive in the uh, job. Seeking promotion within the job preference for assessment certificates that could be legitimately recognized as the employer. So they don't care about um, just the assessment, just certificates, as long as they have something that can take to their you know, boss and say, I've taken this, and you know, can you recognize my, my work in this? That would be uh, the important issue. More examples, valuing freedom to choose, but also wanting more evaluation structure to help make that choice. And also, they, a lot of people ask for formal support in the informal learning environment. And learning just for the sake of learning, but they want their peer recognition about that. Okay, okay I have to stop at this point. I think I've, I've gone over a minute or two and some implications and moving forward, which we can talk about in our um, Q&A session. Yeah. Thank you. And just so you know, that if you get the slides, there are some examples of life change built within you know, people of different age groups and that are um, 
lives are being changed through the MOOCs, and uh, <coughs> they're going back to grad school, they're getting new jobs. Thank you. They're getting new jobs, they're going back to grad school, and so forth and so on. Um, <clears throat> and getting new incomes, you know, starting a new business, retiring and starting a new business. So that's kind of the theme in here, you know, using the skills that they're learning online when they're ordering information at a restaurant and so forth. And by the way, Charles Vest has now passed away, just as a little aside on there. So um, we have five minutes left, I think, for Q&A. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, just if you want to get uh, the papers, we've written two papers up on this. I'm happy to send. Just send me an email. They're in review. Uh, related to some of this data of, of life change, but quite a varied from, from teens all the way up to people in their 70s and 80s. We've got some uh, interesting quotes and phenomena. Okay. So, thank um, you very yeah. much, Dr. Yeah. Simpson. Thank you. Yeah. Has anyone any questions? Yep. Yeah. You want to try to start with that one? What questions should we be answering now or asking now? Um, for me, this, I mean, I am biased as a critical um, researcher. Um, I guess I, I am excited about MOOCs, but at the same time, I'm not, let me just say I probably would not offer a, a MOOC myself because I, you know, I really um, like the intimate setting of the, the courses I'm teaching. I really value one-to-one um, -one face or virtual interaction with my doctoral students. So the idea of MOOCs for me is very, very daunting, and it just, it's, it's, it's not me. But I also embrace the whole idea of MOOCs as a next um, um, big, not next, it's, it's a big thing now. So I'm very interested in critical questions um, about, about something like, you know, who is MOOCs really serving, and who um, is marginalized and um, marginalized by this whole idea of MOOCs. For example, in San Diego State University in the States, um, the professors are really um, critical about this issue of MOOCs, and their administrators trying to take the MOOCs as a way to, um, for the lack of better words, um, replace a lot of associate instructors. Um, so if they take MOOCs, uh, they em employ, I mean, in literally, if they implement MOOCs from Harvard or Stanford for their students for especially um, freshman engineering uh, science classes, they can save a lot of money instead of hiring a lot of um, you know, associate instructors who are you know, teaching those courses. So those are the issues that are um, really kind of, a, for me, important but a kind of dark side of MOOCs. So um, who are we serving and marginalizing through the imp implementation of MOOCs is something that I would be interested in. Uh, yeah, other question, yeah. 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 Yeah, I think the attention paid to translation is is something important, uh, and something we should be, you know, all. In fact, researching intercultural awareness issues, language translation, the tools that are out there for language, that that would be something that actually we should be looking at. Going back to the earlier question, I think also the tools from the Stanford Venture Lab enable more collaboration than some of the other ones. Looking at cross cultural collaboration across these. To answer again the first question, that would be another research area that we should investigate. Uh, and I forget the other half of your question. Was what? Is, is there something really unhelpful that's happening? Uh, unhelpful that's happening? I, th I think being reactionary to things like plagiarism and all of a sudden having an honor code. I think we're way too reactionary to things and not thinking ahead about the impact of some of these. So there's consistent new announcements, whether we're firing presidents at Virginia and then rethinking that. Just people are knee-jerk reactions to all this and jumping in, not having thoughtful plans. But that's, we know that's the case. Yeah. One more. Okay, one more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I need uh, MOOCs are relying on video or PowerPoint or slides. 
Say the last half again. What kind of? What kind of uh, other in, in, engaging technologies do you visualize or engaging methods that will evolve for MOOCs or if you have seen some uh, other than the traditional? Yeah, I think the people at Harvard have done a nice job of responding to the PR that's been out there about engagement. And I think they're coming up with new, and in fact, they've released their data, much of their data, and scrubbed the data without names. So we all can all be analyzing it. But they, they're trying to look at, uh, they mine this data for not just, um, uh, completion, but actually what are the activities that they're engaged in, which are the activities they're selecting and why, and, and, the, and the routes in which people are going through that data. That's more important, I think. I'm going to let Mimi try and we'll end here. You want you an engagement answer on that? Sure. Um, I think depending on what kind of course um, offering platforms they can use, they have different levels of engagement they are allowed to do. So first, um, something like Coursera, I think they have very um, tailored um, platform for um, their clientele like Stanford and Harvard. So um, different kinds of uh, levels of engagements are possible based on what kind of platforms you are um, afforded. And I just want to say thank you for allowing us to come in here as Americans uh, into this uh, event. And there's been three people who have been helpful to me since I've walked in the room. And I just want to give them the last three. Of the, I, have, I have one more left, but here you go. And, of course, Fred's winking at me there, and he would like one. Uh, <clears throat> so I have one more left to the per first person that comes up with a you know, question during break time or later on. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, just hang out. Hang out. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, over to you. Okay. So, yeah, um, I'm from the Open University in Scotland, um, and I wanted to talk about how do I make this thing go away? That's one of the. If I close that. Just minimise it, I think. Minimise it? Okay. Good. Um, 
I sort of want to say something about, a little bit about the gestation of, of why I started thinking about this talk. Um, was that um, <clears throat> someone sent me one of those emails that said, oh, someone from the Open University with a widening participation perspective must come to this conference to talk. It's, and it's going to be you, Ronnie. So, uh, and I, so uh, what I did was, I live in the West Highlands of Scotland, so what I, went, I did was I actually went for a walk with the dog along the loch and thought, what, what am I going to talk about? You know, what am I going to talk about today? And I thought, I suppose it's a sub, partly it's a subset of Lorelai's question around actually what is the solution, you know, what was the question that MOOCs are solution to, you know? And first of all, I wanted to um, start off by just asking people to sort of contribute to this. I mean, thinking about these letters MOOCs, and I mean, I think a lot of us are kind of uncomfortable with them in many senses, is that I wanted people to pick an enabling letter within MOOC. Is it the M? You know, is it is it the massive? Is that the thing that's enabling something in education? The massiveness or the marketingness? Maybe to, maybe that's what the M stands for. Is it the openness that enables something within MOOC? Is that what it is? That it's openly licensed material that we can enter and access. This morning, I was having a Twitter debate with someone who quite clearly believed that it was the online part of MOOCs that was the most important factor that that enabled it. Or is it the fact that it's a course? I mean, people who've been hanging around the open education movement for a while, you know, understand that it actually started off with lots of discussions about learning objects, which were sort of disaggregated bits of content. You know, now that we're packaging them together into a course that's something coherent, a learning journey, is that the thing that's enabling something? So I just wanted to throw that out to the room, just to so think what people, what, what do people think is the enabling word? Is it the M? Is it one of the O's or is it the C? What's the most important bit of the MOOC? It's online. Online, okay. So we've got one online. Oh, damn it, I forgot my notepad. <laughs> I don't know if it's the most important, but the most distinctive is the M. Massive. Yes. Yeah. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Open. 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 From the O, you can pass the others. I was going to say that they're not always open as in free, they're just open as in there's always, you know, they're open. Yeah, but is open always free? I mean, we would say that BBC website's completely open for anyone to look at. It's not, but it's not openly licensed. It's freely available content, but not openly licensed content. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so a bit like yeah, no, carry on. But if it's a connectivist perspective, and when we all know from managing online communities, if there isn't a critical mass of learners, you actually don't get that engagement with other people virtually, do you? you know, so maybe actually there is something in the massive for the learner too. Talk to each other. Yeah. <laughs> well, the argument that I've seen put forward uh, by Stephen Downs is that we need a critical mass so that there are those things to work in favour of the internet. So um, this figure that he's put forward is some number, which is 150. I mean, I think it's fairly obvious, you know. But he, he reckons that you need 150 to get any sort of diversity. It's medium. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You can work effectively when they communicate with people. 
Perhaps, perhaps. Yeah. But it's a label, an uncomfortable label. I mean, sometimes I've been saying recently that, you know, because I work for the Open University and we happen to lead on a, on a MOOC platform, um, you know, sometimes it's like even people sort of say MOOC when they mean open. And, and, it, and it, become, it becomes problematic for us as an institution in, so, in some senses. But I want to put, I picked O, a bit like a lot of people here. And I think that's partly because I work for the Open University. And then I sort of thought, what is it? What is it that's in the O in Open University? Not just the Open University UK, but the Open Universities as a global movement. Well, the OU UK, which is the one I know best, um, is open to people, places, methods, and ideas. And that's our strap line. That's our, you know, that's how we promote ourselves. And, and uh, but also, I think it's actually part of our institutional culture and the way that we approach things. And when you look at other open universities, like in Catalonia or in the Netherlands, and so on, there's some things that sort of join this open universities movement. It's open to people. So no need for previous educational qualifications. Uh, key thing in terms of enabling a whole bunch of things around widening participation, not just widening access, i.e. not just more people accessing education, but broadening the socioeconomic profile of those accessing it. Um, open to places and methods. And that's typically meant because of that geographic openness trying to sort of create that sort of widespread. They tend to be large-scale institutions that cover whole areas. Uh, tend to engage in blended learning, have always experimented with online learning. You know, for some places it's about radio broadcasts and televisions, for other places it's about the internet. But it's been about experimenting in, in sort of broadcast types of learning. Um, and as a consequence, open universities tend to have a sort of few things. They often have a very large student body and a significant uh, number of WP students. So sort of, sort of massive, and I think it was mentioned earlier, you know, that, that some of those, like 20 years ago, one of, you know, Martin Weller's first online course, you know, had 20,000 odd students with a, you know, 70% retention rate. So, and I started to think, what does that mean? I mean, what is it? There's, um, at the time, I was actually trying to understand the M a little bit, the M for marketing within Open. So I was actually reading quite a lot of marketing literature to try and understand um, the people who are sitting around the table now in open education discussions. Because it's not just actually idealists that sit around the table in open education discussions anymore, is it? It's actually marketing professionals. And I didn't understand them because I'm a geographer who lives in the West Highlands. <laughs> and I don't necessarily encounter those kind of metropolitan people in my day-to-day -day life. So I thought I'd better read some of the literature. And I came across uh, this literature about promises within marketing. And I started to think, what was the promises in, in open education? And I thought, it sort of, the promises we make at the OU sort of boil down to sort of three promises. We design our materials and recognize that everyone's in a different place. So it doesn't matter what kind of educational qualifications you have, we will take you and support you. And our materials recognize that you may have no qualifications at all. We understand that you might be uncertain and not want to engage with learning. And you might need support. That support might come from a tutor, but also it actually might come from your fellow students. So that's part of the blend of blended learning, which is actually meeting face to face, and more commonly now about trying to develop online communities where st students support each other. And then the third promise we make is that you'll gain recognition and credit, which actually for someone with no qualifications is a really important promise. So that's the sort of promises that I think the open education and the open universities make. So keep in mind that we're talking about the O and MOOC at the same time. So I just wondered, eh, do these promises matter? This is a picture of my daughter trying to sort of achieve the promise of outdoor education on a sort of outdoor treadmill in uh, Granada. Um, do these promises matter? I mean, what, what are the most important promises there in terms of open education, are they all equal? And are some more equal than others? So I just want to sort of pass that back. And I'll go back to the previous slide to think about those promises. 
I mean, what do people think? Do they think these are good? Do they, do they think I've sort of captured these? Yes? I was talking about the open unit. I haven't quite gone to MOOCs yet, but say. Uh, <laughs> Anyone else? Do you think these are p important promises for open universities, for openness in general? I suppose that's what I'm talking about. But the important thing would be to have different levels. Levels, OK. Yeah. I think, to follow on from what Brian said, it's something to do with structure. Uh, I've mean, just done a few open university MOOCs as well, and I think what it provides is a, a structure for your your study, you know, you like and you could read about anything and if you take one of your other slides, you could mm -hmm. read about anything anywhere else. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I studied last week. But the, uh, so the same principle mm -hmm. here, yet what it does is sort of bounds off that stuff and you're in there with an knowledge group of people. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's about designing the learning materials in a structured way that actually lead learners through. There's something about it. That structure doesn't always work either whether you or you are MOOCs, but mm -hmm. it does give you that sort of spine. It's not the only thing to it, but mm -hmm. it does give you a kind of a and we certainly, I mean, you know, when I'm working as a learning designer and thinking about how I might design materials for a broad range of learners who have educational experience, I mean, those kind of structuring that learning journey seems important. There seem to be quite a few constraints in terms of the Mm -hmm. of what they're doing. So in that set of principles there, there are some constraints on, I would say, on that autonomy. So the constraint of you will gain recognition here and credit, well, it might not be, that might not be the choice. And um, we understand that you will want, need people to support you. Well, that's, that's very broad, actually, as well. It's not necessarily a constraint. Well, it might be a Mm, and sometimes it, in open universities we do insist on people having support whether they want it or not. Yeah? I think the middle one is the most interesting for me. I think if you, and I've taught a couple of open courses myself, um, I think if you say to somebody, you're paying some money, <coughs> you're doing an open course, we'll support you wherever you come from, whatever, whatever. Uh, there's a particular set of implications. And those implications aren't you have to provide structure, services, and support in a particular kind of way. Um, and I think the OU does a pretty good job of doing that. But it's the whole package that you have to provide. Mm. You have to provide that package for each course. Uh, you know, courses that you to participate in the science parts of it. Um, when you do MOOCs, I think precisely the autonomy issue starts turning it upside down and says it's not the provider's responsibility entirely uh, to make sure that you have the support. The provider is now saying anybody on the planet can do it. There's no way that we can uh, provide support, etc., etc., etc. We're even understand it. 
Mm. So what you're going to do is you're going to provide something. It's up to you guys. Mm. Um, however, within that, and I think it's one of the issues that you guys raised in the paper, uh, there's a whole lot of implications. What happens if somebody comes on a MOOC and the discussion just goes up to postgraduate level? Mm. There's a postdoc there, which often happens. And I've been on both sides, of the, certainly as a learner, I've been in a MOOC where it's kind of going around and people are kind of hedging and not saying... The levels are unclear. Uh, the levels are unclear, and then suddenly somebody comes in with something really interesting. And it's completely a postdoc level. Mm. In fact, it's, it's, it's a mature researcher level. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that thing about <coughs> uncertainty... And it, runs, and it runs away from everybody else. Mm. One of the implications of that, I think, I think that's one of the things that MOOCs do, is they say, well, you have to be, well, you can be autonomous, mm -hmm. and if you're autonomous, then there's a whole lot of sinking and swimming going on there. Absolutely, and, and that, and that's why the so, and that's why the sort of socio-economic profile perhaps is different, you know. Yeah. I was just going to say that it's, 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 it's that's part of the day, it's part of for you, mm -hmm. and that's part of your time. If people are experienced learners can find a way through that for all the reasons we've talked about, and if you're not an experienced learner, you just drop out. That seems to be the hot a fade away from mm -hmm. that. And I suppose that's why I stress to high, highlight because. At the Open University, in our formal curriculum, you know, we feel that these are key promises that we're going to support you because we understand that you're likely to be uncertain. You know, it, it, it was Charlie, you had quite, quite, quite a lot of support. Absolutely, it's never quite enough. Still but people. Absolutely. But um, um, so that it's kind of built in for people who are less experienced learners, essentially. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I think that's why one of the key questions for me is is around this 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 sort of big sort of thing that actually what we're saying is that these massive courses are somehow widening participation, and that or they or they have the promise of widening participation. It's just that we're not quite doing them right yet. I mean, is there a way that we can do them? Because at the moment, what they've done is widening access. I mean, I would. I don't know, people are familiar with this differentiation between widening access and widening participation. Widening access, more people accessing it. Widening participation, broadening the socioeconomic profile of those that access it. I mean, so for example, the expansion of higher education in the UK post-97 broadened access. More people went to university in the UK, but the socioeconomic profile of those people who went didn't change. More middle class people went. And that, you know, but not, not more working class people. In fact, the, you know, the 60s was actually better for that than anything else. Oh, well, ah, yeah. So, what are the pro... I suppose I wanted to now get, get into groups, yeah? Just for this last bit. And actually ask, you know, having discussed those promises within the open education movement, are there promises, you know, and obviously these, you know, I've been, I've been deliberately simplistic about it promises with the open education movement to try and sort of stimulate discussion. But I wonder, are there promises um, that we might want to make for MOOCs? Are there some key promises? I mean, I, there's been some interesting ones already mentioned today about, I promise we will connect you with other like-minded people, seems to be a big sort of thing that's coming up. <laughs> um, I promise it will be fun. Um, you know, so I mean, are there particular promises? And I just thought maybe we could. There's two sort of groups here, two orbs. I've got some bits of paper, uh, and I wondered if we could just spend the uh, rest of the time. I put this up because I, I just really like this. This has got a rich picture from the systems course at the OU, and it's got like about the miner strike, which is, uh, so I was just put that up. Uh, and Tarzan, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You know, uh, and this. It is, yes, yes, Tarzan, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, and obviously I just thought I'd put an elephant in the room uh, as well. Um, so, yeah, and I've got some paper and some pens, some really old fashioned technology being around for. Can I ask a really old yeah, sure. Who are we? Who are you? No, who's the we in the, uh, the left wing and the right wing? <laughs> <laughs> as educators. As institutions or as educators? As educators. <laughs> <coughs> wow, well, I've actually got two pads. I did ask for a room that was a little bit more. Uh... 
But look, I'll pass one pad there. Oh, did I hit your head there? No, no, no. <laughs> 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 you will regret that when I start, <laughs> <laughs> start rolling. <laughs> now, the reason I put the rich picture, rich picture up uh, was because, I, you know, I don't want to tell you how to sort of map out your thoughts about what the promises are, but Peter Checklin's stuff about rich pictures is very good. Eh? Lovely, do, do, you, do you know uh, Peter Checklin's daughter's here today? Yes. <laughs> Here's some pens. A pile of pens. <laughs> Are you going to facilitate it, are you? I'm facilitating. Excellent. <laughs> you can, yeah, draw. You can draw. Well, I just thought I'd put that up there just to suggest you might want to draw a rich picture. And also, I'm, I'm really glad because actually Peter Checklin's daughter is here today, but she isn't in the session. Because like, I actually I actually did that I did a session with Rich Pictures once before, yeah, and she and she went like, I really like that. That was my dad. <laughs> she works for the OU, so she was she was she was co-presenting with Frida Wolfenden earlier. <laughs> You don't need to draw to do rich pictures. <laughs> everybody, well, uh, the, the idea with the, with the rich picture is that everybody draws something, and, but actually and you pass the pen around and you actually discuss what you're going to draw and agree it. Well, we'll and if you can't agree, then you show that you're not agreeing about different bits. Well, as we're the left-wing group, we'll do an impoverished picture. Is that an impoverished, okay? impoverished, <laughs> impoverished picture. And they're going to do the, the, the MOOCs as a product of neoliberalism picture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is my political standpoint. <laughs> Marketing. Yeah. Well, that's to get the academics to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And to agree to have their film, you know, to be filmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the same in open education. I mean, did you see the big survey that just did in 2012 around motivations for open education? Uh, and the biggest one was actually, you know, it sort of started off people talking about altruistic motives, but actually when you start to dig out, it's like, oh, I want to be a really famous academic, and then for the managers, it's like, I want my fame institution to be really famous. <laughs> that is good drawing, isn't it? <laughs> Just do a pound note. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> we all know what that is. <laughs> 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 but, um, they should be. <laughs> that would be a completely different story on him. <laughs> but the, they are the packers. Those who, those who provide the, the package to what we, to what we provide. Yeah? It's interesting. I think that people were talking about what the, you know what these people promised was this visibility yeah. and stability. 
that it wouldn't crash. That it'll be different. That we don't have to do the tech. Yeah, that you don't have to yeah. do the tech. It's outsourcing, basically. I don't know what the Coursera one is. Is that like a... It's something like an eight, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. really not. I should be. Hey, well, look. I'll yeah, put the names yeah. in it. That's a present. Mm -hmm. It's a present that people are giving. <laughs> and it's the and it's the packet of the present what they provide. Yeah. yeah how much more do you want? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. This is good. This what is good. I'm just oh, explaining. Paris, I'm just explaining like what you. What They're you not. not <laughs> <laughs> I probably shouldn't. Yeah. The money. Should I do the money dropping out? Yeah, the money. Money dropping out. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so venture capital company. Euro, Euro, yes. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that the Euro? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can't do it. Yeah. It's just raining money. Yeah, it's raining money. <laughs> Into the pot. Yeah. Of the bankers. <laughs> yeah, it all comes back to them. <laughs> it's a bloody bankers. <laughs> <laughs> Let's blame them. <laughs> Oh, and they're what here. We should have the world because you get promised the world, don't you? But actually, there's this, you know. I mean, the promise was that actually we were going to educate the world, reach the world. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. promising to educate the world, yeah. but they're promising the world to students. Oh, not, I mean, to be too cynical. <laughs> <laughs> this is supposed to be a positive day. <laughs> But it is supposed to be all these people who are all over the world. Without raising the spectrum of them being broken. Absolutely. <laughs> all these people all over the world are supposed to be getting this open education. Women's things. So we need to get the promises next, don't we? Because there was, you know, there was... With the sort of arrow, I think it's a bit Because the big... Um, the people who've really made the big splash in, in, in MOOCs and open education are those institutions with massive reputations already. Yes. Right, yeah. So, um, yeah. <laughs> 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 but Edinburgh don't need it either, but they're doing it. <laughs> 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 they don't need more reputation. Mm. <laughs> 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 Absolutely. Well, no, I think Edinburgh sometimes. Yeah. Was this Michael? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and we're trying to do the widening access mm. thing. And these are people who are probably not looking to come to a university course. We, may be, we should be tempting them with something that isn't putting itself forward as that. Yeah. So is it the pro is it finally realising the promise of the public un of the of the eight years of public good? <laughs> I don't know, should you be tempting them all to go to university? Given choice is good, but you know, I mean, does everybody want to do it? They might just want to know a wee bit about such and such and so and so. It doesn't necessarily mean they want to take a degree in, in higher music. Or nor should they? So. It's like even the, the, the OU, much loved the OU, it still is a replica of a British university. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's modules and credits and this and that, and, yeah. and your learning is, you know, full. In big credits. chunks. You do an exam in yeah. big chunks. And, 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 you know, it's. I mean, I've been happy through it all you push. I think I've learned enough now. <laughs> that was my point about American universities. American universities are better chunks. They have smaller chunks, so they've already broken it down in a, in a more interesting way. So, so kind of, are we answering any of those questions? Uh, no. So, no, sh sh should we get to number two then? Yeah. Oh, okay. So, any means if we. Well. I mean, I think. Well, I anyone man, got anything to add? <laughs> but at the moment, yeah. we promise more for more people, so increasing access, but question mark next to participation. Uh, they imply quality, <laughs> the brand name. Is that important? Um, I must confess, I was slightly lost track on the application of the US motivated instructional design based at training. No, 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 that's, that's the point. That's the point. It's an is that something? Design. Yeah. Is that something that is implied in all MOOCs? Is that something that is explicit in all MOOCs? There is a particular learning design discourse, isn't there, around how a MOOC ought to be? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't think that that one is the key. Which to it. I don't think that one fits the, the air, actually, frankly, yeah. to be honest. Sorry? I don't think that one fits the air. We're Which not one? promising that, the instructional design. Yeah, okay. So if, if you take a MOOC, will it be in a certain format with a certain <laughs> philosophy, <laughs> shall we say, behind it? Hope not. Well, it will. It will, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, asking, I'm, well, asking, I'm asking questions. I don't know. It will, yeah. unconsciously. Okay. Uh, we'll leave that one in. But what, what surprise, uh, not surprise, but what um, I find interesting is that exactly to the point that she mentioned, you know, that we even now, right now, the yeah. moves are just essentially taking the videos, the PowerPoint, yeah. Yeah. essentially taking the whatever you do traditionally and just bolting it online. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. no real innovation around <laughs> how using the technologies could make it engaging. It's, it's still taking the list of tradition. It's because what are you doing? You're video recording the lecture, or you're just it's putting up a slide. But it's really that. interesting. I mean, there's a, I know this academic, he's a mathematician who works, he's sort of, and uh, he, and he works at the OU, and he did his first book where it was Sage on the Stage, videos of, a ma of maths lectures, and he went, oh my God, what have we been doing for all this time? We should just be videoing people and putting them online. Why are we writing these courses? You know, so he just sort of went like all this other instructional, you know, all this other learning design stuff and embedding activities and making it interactive is all just a load of rubbish. We should just be filming clever people. I know, I know it is, but it's so interesting. Yeah. Oh, that that to me, the, the, the dropout represents the fact that the, what does not work in the classroom, okay. you're now massively <laughs> and, and exactly. You're exactly getting the same. To be honest, honest, to be honest I think that's overstated. I do. What? Well, so well, the I mean, how many, how many courses, or how many books have you started? I mean, you go into yeah. it for all kinds of reasons. I've been in at least three. I had no intention of finishing it. Or even yeah. I was kind of floating around. I wanted to be better. So I think that's okay you know, for someone who has yeah. one of the educational halves. If you're an economic and educational half, it's okay to dip in to get that just-in-time yeah. learning. Yeah, 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 if you're an educational yeah. half, not. But is that not? Is that I mean, there's a guy. Do you know a guy, Orman Simpson? Is this sort of? Yeah. Is, yeah. 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 And uh, I mean, he talked about the sort of the harm of non-completion. 
you know, what is the psychological yeah. harm yeah, yeah, yeah. of actually not completing? If you're an uncertain or unsure student and you go, and he was actually talking about analyses he's done of open universities, of the dropout rates. Well, actually, I've been kicked out of three universities. I mean, I've been kicked out of a well, bachelor's degree, <laughs> <laughs> a master's degree, and a PhD. How did you and not actually, go I learned more by being kicked out of becoming <laughs> No, but I mean, if, you look, uh, if you're looking at the demographics of people who are participating, you don't know the people who you would be thinking of what was going to happen. That's come up several things. times, isn't yeah. it? Mm. Diana's. And uh, I'm not arguing ah, for that, by the way. I'm mm. just saying, you know, mm. that. But so I think one of the prom at the moment, you know, one of the promises that's a little bit empty is is around this. Act. Well, actually, because I actually think it is about access. It's about the same way that post ninety seven education was about access for those. Well, it, I didn't make it clearly in my talk, but when we did the research um, for the Mac Data for Community Content, mm -hmm. we found, you know, the District mm -hmm. Content, we found there is no content. Actually, that's why we came up with why we the Learner Generated mm -hmm. Context Group. So once you've got access, you then need better content. When you've got better content, you need better context. <laughs> so actually, there is no killer content in the pr for, for enabling people mm -hmm. to learn. So the interesting thing, like with um, the, the research that, mm -hmm. that, that, that me, me did, because she's talking about people actually using that things in particular ways. That, that in a sense what the university is pushing out it's not being in, used in the way that it's being pushed out it's like people saying oh I could use that to do this and, and that's this. And yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and actually that's you know sometimes in a campus based it's university actually, that's what we really want people to do because we actually want to people to actually take some of that content that we're providing in the lecture and actually apply it in their own context in fact you know it's like one of the things that we strive to do we're desperate to do all, yeah, the sorry, access, all the open widening access stuff that our university does, because we're in uh, lots of deprived areas, mm -hmm. whatever, they do. They, they don't do traditional university stuff to get to mm -hmm. people into it. They they do things like you know fun plays about mm -hmm. chemistry and mm -hmm. have taster days and interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Things, like the MOOCs could be done differently. They don't have mm -hmm. to be. Here is a course about a thing. It could be more like. like the things they're doing with the interactive storytelling on YouTube where they're retelling like the Lizzie Bennet diaries mm -hmm. and it's not just a series of videos they get people commenting and interacting with the characters so they're thinking about their motivations and being like why is she doing this and then people comment and they're like by the way you've just learned Pride of Prejudice and gone into all yeah. this stuff and yeah. here's some background information I completely agree I think the most interesting one indeed was the storytelling format I haven't really looked at it so I don't really know but that yeah. storytelling approach I think is really very powerful potentially. I think one of the most interesting things It's because looks, before we had civilization, we learned from storytelling. Story. So I don't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So but one of the most interesting story. things is this whole MOOC HE thing reminds me very much of Second Life and Virtual Worlds in HE. Oh, yeah. We all bit these big, uh, big islands. I was, was in the there. the first thing they did so, that? Uh, and uh, it was the first thing the universities did to build themselves a campus so they could walk up the yeah. stairs virtually <laughs> and sit down in a virtual <laughs> window yeah. and watch a virtual Absolutely. lecture. That's what they've done with <laughs> the MOOCs. They've created exactly. the class. In fact, I worked on a GIST project that tested whether people, how realistic a campus needed to be for a student to learn. Which was not funded by anybody. Anyway, so that's exactly the point. I mean, uh, when you mentioned this dropout, I totally agree that there could be some various reasons why people drop out. Uh, but I think that's it. That's that's the whole thing, like you know, these interactive methods, like uh, storytelling or like games. Uh, I mean, like you. Websites. Yeah. YouTube is massive. I mean, YouTube is huge. I mean, I, I built my. So I think about it. I was, I was running this project with social housing tenants up in Aberdeen, <laughs> uh, where I was actually trying to design some learning materials about fuel poverty, designed by those in fuel poverty. And, the and we, so we were coming up with some prototype solutions about how to do it. And the, of course, the first thing they said is like, where do you go to learn something? They were like, YouTube. And then I, I was, at the time, I was building my own house. And I, sort of, and I realized that without a 3G signal and my mobile phone, when I got stuck, when I was building my house, I don't think I could have got any further without YouTube. Because yeah. I'd have to, and even some of the tradesmen who came in, they were like, hold on, I'll just go and look at, you know, because every manufacturer, a boiler manufacturer, would have a whole bunch of YouTube videos. The plumber would be on site going, it's different, hold on, let me look it up on YouTube. And they're sitting there looking it up, learning. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
more like it goes Google, YouTube, and then things like. Yeah, so YouTube is that you know. So I think your point is a really, really good one. That's what I mean. We're promising that, but we're not going to deliver it because there's all kinds of challenges to it. The first is the university online again. Yeah, yeah. And that's you know, and that's okay for some. I'm quite keen. I think you know. It's like I think we make openness in our, in our own form. You know. But I, I used to teach the history of technology, and the thing you find with any new technology is the first form that it takes is to enable the previous form. Yeah, so absolutely. It it enables it enables it. Yeah, and then people learn. It's and like, then oh, okay, we can yeah, do this differently. Right. But do you know, I think the one true, of the most helpful things about this whole debate has been that um, making a pedagogy or even two pedagogies synonymous with a platform. It's a bit of technology. That MOOC thing, and uh, you know, it's all yeah. sort of designed by one or two people <laughs> yeah. around a particular bloody technology. It's not the same thing. Who will have an instructional design background? Well, I don't know what's the same thing. But I, I, I do think there is something there. It's like we get confused between actually uh, what we want, what 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 the technology is, and what we want it to enable. Yeah. I mean, actually, I mean, what the promises around these MOOCs is that we want to enable like widespread access to educational materials and widen, widen the socio-economic base of education. Well, that's, you know, that's what politicians say. But actually, we just get completely... <laughs> we just, yeah, actually, you know, but we get completely caught up. When we actually start a discussion about what, what it is, we get completely caught up on a whole bunch of other things, don't we? Nobody entirely knows what they want books to do anyway, because we don't want to turn education free, because we don't have a bloody job. But at the same time, and yeah, not everybody should want no, to do the same things with them. The nature of the job would change. It would qualitatively change. Well, no, it's not Not everybody should want to do the yeah, same yeah, thing. Yeah, then it's not free. It's a social cost. At the moment, it's running off the backs of already paid for university courses. So... I'll be interested the, when it was in and marketing budgets is what it's yeah, running off the back of. It's kind of weird in a way. Sorry. That's the kind of way that so much money is going into MOOCs from universities when actually all the content is out there. Mm. It's actually how you aggregate it and present it in different ways. You know, people are self, mm. yeah, self curation with, with YouTube. It's like we need to be, we don't have to have these massive well. systems. There's all of that. Simplest of content. Yeah. We need to think about how we curate that content. Actually, there is a bloke in Japan, and I can't mind his name, and he's doing MOOCs with games. I, haven't, I, I went in and I thought it was games were rotten, actually, but I think it's quite a good, uh, it's quite an interesting concept. It's, you know, unfortunately, it's a computing course he's doing, so that's really unfortunate. But the whole idea <laughs> of, um, well, the whole idea of building, um, building games with your learners or your potential learners and using them, putting them up in open source, letting people play in them to learn specific things is actually really interesting. So if it is about those things, what promises ought we to be making to enable those things to happen? <laughs> what, is, what are the enabling things to make those kind of things that, you know, we've read your conversation moved on to, like, what, what it should be, what would enable it to happen? No, I'm just adding because you mentioned this move for the game. Uh, I'm going to leave you at that. <laughs> no, but I will. Let you cry. I will. I will. I will ask for one at in. At Ten no, what, what time do we finish? Twenty past. So I'll ask for someone. Yeah, eight minutes. Okay. Eight minutes. Yeah, we're going to publish this. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> hey, don't you realise this is part of my research for my paper? Promise my picture. I put it in my CDSA last yeah. week. That I was going to write a paper about the promises of open education. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't um, think of anything else in the week. That's nice. Have we answered the question? Oh, yeah. We're going to come back in about eight minutes to, for some feedback. At the moment, running a session. <laughs>
Yeah. yeah. Who had you against the Liverpool stuff? <laughs> I'm running a session. It came loud and clear. And ah. It was like, oh, what's that? Let's Nielsen. Was. It was Frida. <laughs> it was Frida. <laughs> she was going like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It's absolutely fundamentally <laughs> revolutionary. Yeah. And nobody's been paying a bit of attention to it. And this is what it comes. So that question of how that happens is actually a really important one. So what do you need? Okay. Engaging content, relevant content, context that's meaningful, um, places for support. Um, places for engagement. You've got to write this down. Because you've only you've only got a few minutes. A simple word. Big data, yeah. Big data. Where and there's a lot of pro. Where is it? <laughs> a lot of people are asking where the data is. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very, very good. That you, the big data has now left not a lot of room for it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was then someone over there mentioned mentioned Second Life. I, I remember when Second Life sort of hit. I worked yeah. on. I worked on a number of Second Life projects. As, oh, as I'm think. sure we all did. Yeah. And uh, I thought that. And uh, so I worked on this one called SCOM, which was not school, not home. It was yeah, actually on the team right. grid. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I was one of the facilitators. And it, there was massive amounts of data, I think even more because it involved adults interacting with young people. Yeah. So there was all sorts of geolocation data. And I remember being presented with probably thousands and thousands of pages of data oh, and just going like, what do I do with it? Yeah, it's like, yeah. it's, it's like and I, the only thing I can think is like, just because we can collect it doesn't mean it doesn't make it mean anything. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it was. That's true, isn't it? You can, they have sessions now, don't they? Like <coughs> um, Simon Buckingham Shum did one about how you look at data. Like now you've got it all. What do you do? Yeah, I used to work with. I used to work in KMI with Simon. He's in Australia. He's gone to Australia now. Is he really? Yeah. yeah. Is this about linked data, about linking da data at different scales and stuff like that? No, no, what you're saying is oh, the stuff that comes out of that, um, that learning plan. Mm. Uh, oh, the tool that they've got. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's small data or local data. Actually, like Locally local sourced data. data. Yeah, mm -hmm. from, from their tool. So local data. But I think because little data. Hmm? So little data. <laughs> because I think I, I think the big you know I think it isn't about big data. I think it's about little data. I think it is about little data about actually locating, getting much more data about what's happening in particular places. I think that's. It's actually, actually, I think if you combine those, it's about contextualised data. So the, one of the things about big data is it's often decontextualised. Mm. But if you want the sort of data that's going to give you a really rich picture, it's got to be, I think, richly contextualised, and then it becomes very problematic. Because when, when I ask for analytics on, my, on some of the open content I've produced, you know, I mean, we do a lot of face-to-face -face events to support the use of open content. And what I do is I ask for the data by geographic location. So if I'm doing a, an event, if I know that someone's running an event in the mm -hmm. Scottish borders, you know, I'm looking for a peak of... I'm looking to see if actually people are then logging on and doing it post-event. You know, so that locatedness is important because I actually then want to... Because then I need to go back and say to the people who are paying for this open content, well look, you know, we're doing this and it's having an, a, an effect locally and I can track it, I have some data.
even if it's actually, if you looked at the reliability, <laughs> it might be dodgy. It might be local to an event like that that you're talking about, an event in a physical location, or it might be local to an event like, I, I, I worked on Blackboard and you didn't get a lot of useful data. Mm. One of the things I found really useful and really encouraged me was to see the stuff being used at the time that the students were doing the research. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really encouraging, the fact that you planned it for this earlier point, mm -hmm. but they still had access to it. To oh, that's good. Okay. So the event the research. So I'm going to pull everybody back. <laughs> no, I'm going to pull you all back from the brink. I'm going to pull you all back from the brink. Someone's going to have to go up to the front and talk about the picture. So, right, are you going to talk about the picture? <laughs> yeah, go on then. I'll try and explain it. <laughs> okay, I'll hold it up. There's a mic. Okay, so we're going to talk about the, the, the group A. <laughs> um, group A, is it? Group A. <laughs> That's <laughs> epic. <laughs> <laughs> you found it. All right, where do you want? Yeah. Okay. And then smile for the audio. Right, this Right, go. go, on. go on. Okay, talk. Oh, right, okay, sorry. Um, so we said about the promises that... Um, Data, big data can make. So we've got big data down here. Big data, um, little ethics, because we think <laughs> ethics really hasn't come in so much. The promises, and we love ethics. And we've got little data, which is contextualized, which is more useful. So that's why there's a tick there. Um, we think MOOCs can offer the community. So it's about community. There's a big hug for a community. Um, and the, the, I'm doing the positives first. Um, we said people get new skills from it. Um, we actually started with the fact that academics become rising stars. So the idea is the promise that we make to academics is that we'll make you big. We'll make you big someday. This will make you everything. Um, uh, and then we were talking about, in 2012, how um, the ex-MOOCs came in. And suddenly it was um, because, and we're saying that's the institutions going, whoa, stop this C-MOOC stuff. We want this to look like what we know and love and we make money from. So we want to have that. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've given up. I'll, I'll do consultancy. Um, and then we were saying this, <laughs> the gap between the students and the rising stars. The idea was that we would bring these two together so the students would actually be able to be taught by world-class academics from around the world, Michael Sandel, etc. Them and 20,000 others. Not taught, yes. not <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's no teacher. Yeah. Um, so we had, and they're getting smaller and smaller because they're further and further away from the real academics. Um, and then we were saying about marketing technology, corporations, governments, and um, efficiencies are all the interests that f pull in the line between the academics and the students. So it gets rid of the connections. Um, we said this is um, given to us in a package. So these are the platform providers. So this is FutureLearn and edX and Coursera, and they promise us this thing that will um, facilitate learning for the whole world. But actually what it's caused is there's a social divide because these are the institutions that are the elite institutions that already had a very high profile. And um, yes, and they're basically the platform providers have lots of money and they have the data and it goes into a pot of gold. <laughs> this is the cynical <laughs> side. We were getting quite creative, <laughs> probably. But I think that's pretty much, these are the institutions, they get more students. That was another promise that you'd have more students. Um, so yeah. Oh, and there's social media on the outside of the box making money because they're getting our data. So we are the product. We know that, don't we? But there we are. Good. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Comments, questions from uh, group, group A too? Top that, B team. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, B team. Let's. <laughs> right. B team. Yeah. No pressure. No pressure. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to hold this. I'll hold it. I'll hold Do you want to have the microphone? Yeah, I have the mic. Okay, you can see that uh, we were obviously... Uh, oh, that's all, that's it. That's it. Uh, you can see that obviously we were more graphically challenged, and uh, it came out a bit more like a stream of consciousness or unconsciousness. 
<laughs> depending on that. So uh, we'll try and make a little bit of sense of this. So uh, we could cover some of the, a lot of the same ground as you'd expect. Um, more access and, and so on. We, we, um, we felt that was one of the promises of the MOOC. There was something about quality. We felt that MOOCs were trying to say that there's a quality and it's often by the university or you're saying an individual brand was some kind of important there. I'm going to jump over that one for a second. Uh, lowering costs. Um, Option to opt in and out, a big debate about this, about uh, a, a sort of a long-standing MOOC uh, debate about uh, if people opt in and out of that, is that okay? Does that mean anything? Does that mean that the, the student themselves has more autonomy and we've let go of that kind of idea of the course so the students can come in and go? Um, and then we had another great debate about university level stuff, is that what we do is obviously replicating university level courses. And we talked a bit about the OU as well, did the same sort of thing. Uh, and is that really uh, appropriate? If we, do, if we put a university level courses out there and we say they're open and we find that university trained people come in and use them, is that really a surprise? So we're saying that maybe we should sort of break that down a little bit. Uh, we also talked, go jump back up here, a little bit about what's the embedded uh, models in there. We're a bit worried about this whole instructional design stuff. Is that right, guys? We, we were a bit worried that it was, um, uh, there was something embedded inside MOOCs. And I'm saying even in my university we started talking about instructional designers, which have never talked about that before. Mm -hmm. And we felt that come from the kind of MOOC world of, of that. So we have experts, instructors. <laughs> it's funny looking over the top there. Um, <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, mean, I think that's an interesting promise. You know, I mean, at the moment we say, like, you know, we might say a promise you make in school is that you'll sit quietly in the classroom in yes. the 1950s. Now we're saying a promise in a MOOC is that you'll learn in this particular way. Yes, yes. Learning, and so you have the subject expert, the instructional designer, and then the student. And this seems to be a, a demarcation we've seen quite a few times. Now, we started our, our stream of consciousness quite even more unconscious at this level. Ban the word MOOC, yeah. Change job descriptions, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, what have we got there? Um, there was actually, there's actually an interesting one, I, I think, around here. Is we have this promise that we're going to somehow develop our students, make them more self-determined learners and so on. And, and we had an interesting, I think you said that, actually, that when uh, students drop out of these things, what messages are we giving back to them? Is that, is that enabling? Or are we either giving them more in control or are we actually saying, no, you failed, you're coming to MOOC and failed? I think yeah. in, in your group around the sort of dropout, I mean, some people were saying, well, you know, sometimes <coughs> dropping out and making a conscious decision not to complete is enabling in itself, Fred. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought that's an interesting point. It could be either way. <laughs> yes, you it's could. An it's, it's, maybe it's an interesting point for someone who's confident, for someone who's less certain. If it's a conscious decision, it's enabling. If it's, uh, I've now got lost and I can't do, oh, do it. <laughs> no, no, I was, I was, I was uh, being a student at that one. Um, okay, so then down we're down. And then we've got this other, more promises down here, down here, which I think which are, again, going back on the kind of positive sides about um, quite engaging material. And some of the stuff is good. I mean, even the kind of uh, X moocs are quite, quite interesting. Um, better engagement, storytelling, we saw an example there, games and so on, mix of methods. So we could actually have this kind of enabling part of education. And that may be one of the promises we have here is this, that MOOCs uh, are helping us to develop this kind of new models. Um, but um, a promise around innovation. A promise around innovation. Go on. I was going to throw it back to you guys. I was going to throw it back now. Yes. Yes. We were really worried about that because, as I say, we've really created little mini universities, or little mini university courses, and then, as I say, we're surprised that little university people come along and use them. I think one of the early promises of MOOCs was that we wouldn't create those things, that it would be innovative, that yes. it would be different, that we would bring in game-based learning, that we would bring in all these different but things. But even the size of a course, you know, the sort of like six weeks, oh, it looks a little bit like half a course. And, you know, knowledge doesn't, in my experience, knowledge doesn't really kind of fit into those little blocks. And I quite like this discussion that uh, Diana was talking about this morning about mini MOOCs and breaking it down into something much smaller, more, more kind of, uh, not fragmented, but just smaller bite-sized stuff. Anything else, folks? Of course, I mean, one of the things that I would say is that private, you know, private sector providers are better at doing those little chunks of learning. They are, actually, yeah. And is that maybe why private sector providers are, I don't know, is that why they look at these opportunities around MOOCs? Because they can actually see that they can, they're better yes, at chunking that learning. Whereas you work at a university, you're used to thinking about it as being a, a long time, aren't yes, you? Yes, yes. We have a distant voice here. Mm. Which is, if you've got a, a, a company that's funded by venture capital and they're trying to make their way in the world, I'm not saying all platforms are like that, that you have a vested interest in stressing, one could say over-stressing, the innovative nature. Of, so you've got to say that the innovation is mm. disruptive, mm. Yes. it's got to be different, mm. and actually has to specifically not recognise all the ways in which it is very much embedded in the history of mm. education and technology. Absolutely. 
absolutely. And, and mm. Martin Weller emphasised that point in his uh, some of the pro- uh, some of the provisional chapters for Battle of the Open. I think he's mm-hmm. right about it. He's emphasising this, this emphasis on disruption and disruptive technologies. Uh, and also, I mean, I mean, part of that's part of neoliberalism, isn't it? We always like to sort of emphasise disruptive innovation with a neoliberalism because neoliberalism is quite often about smashing old economies and generating new economic but the really opportunities. The thing for education is that this, the critique of Clayton Christensen's disruptive innovation, is already well um, played out in other areas that tech startups have been. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty sad that education just takes it all, you know. Mm. <laughs> I think we are arguing about it. Yeah. There's a whole bunch yeah. of us yeah. they who are actually asking some critical questions, and we'll go back to our institutions and hopefully just, ask how does that, how does that How does that go back up, though? I so think that's the problem. Uh, Alt anti Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and did you say you're going to chair it? Yeah, I'll chair it. Yeah. <laughs> care that they don't settle down and yes. become because yes. actually I mean what but if with newer newer methods if you're walking into a museum and you have yes. this Google Glass or something and then you know uh, all the knowledge about that artifact comes up to your this uh, you know you can just imagine yes. the kind of but possibilities because I think that we end up creating these things you know the, the foundations that we lay down actually then condition the structures that we build upon them you know I think that you know when I look at openness and the way that different universities have done open They've all done them, done it in different ways, and it's conditioned yeah, by right. the, the institutional culture. I mean, the way the OU does open is conditioned by the way it does mm. its standard offer. Standard. You know, and say, you know, I was having a colleague ask me because uh, about we were we've got this project around supporting open educational practices and the practices around the creation of open education. Mm. And he sort of said to me, he said, he says, oh, he says it's all very well giving away our content because there's content everywhere. What I really don't want you to tell tell them about is how we do stuff. Because our practices is what differentiate us. And I sort of said, well, actually, do you know what? People know how other institutions do stuff. And they don't <coughs> copy it because actually every institution thinks the way they do it is right. And that's why they then replicate it when they create their MOOCs and their, and their open. But so, I mean, while we shouldn't worry about some of these early structures and MOOCs, we also shouldn't, should pay some attention to those foundations because they may condition our responses to in those in the future. Case, in that case, I think uh, having the fact that there are startups coming out mm-hmm. which are more from, like, which don't have this burden of the mm-hmm. you know, past cultural or whatever, mm-hmm. will allow them the freedom to go and think in very different ways. Whereas, you're right, I mean, if you're coming from a particular mm-hmm. university which has a culture, yeah. they will, so I think in the initial uh, few days where the startup has just decided to partner with the universities and adopt uh, their uh, mm-hmm. way of doing it, They are still going through there. <laughs> yeah. So I think yeah. it's, I suppose they're like, you know, picking up sort of Fred's background around paradigms. You know, I mean, Thomas Kuhn's work around sort of paradigm shifts and that sort of, I mean, I suppose we're actually looking at some of those sort of, some of those early discussions where a number of things, I guess you probably, you, you'll be able to talk more eloquently than well, I, I will. Say, <laughs> a lot of my work now comes from Paul, uh, Paul Poirot. Okay. On the paradigm shifts, which is, which is actually about how that actually paradigm shifts come from thinking out, well, I mean, we say outside the box, but actually it's about, more about intuitive and doing things that don't seem to make sense and mm-hmm. then bringing them back. So he actually argues slightly differently to, to anyway, to him. Thomas Kuhn. No, differently to Kuhn. It's Paul Boyer on it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So he yeah, annoys me on what I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. But, but that's an important point. We're at a disruptive phase. Part of the thing is we don't know what that next phase will be. You no. have to experiment with different stuff. So if you just de-enable the university, you're definitely not getting the right answer. It's working for now, mm-hmm. because the university's got a huge legacy. Mm-hmm. Government are pointing at people saying, you have to have qualifications to do stuff. There's a lot of weight being mm-hmm. put on people getting a certain kind of qualification, but that's not what the next generation learning is going to be. And I think that's the most important. For me, that's the 
what's going in. So <laughs> not a kind of, oh, sorry. No, so I was going to say, yes, yeah, the same. Just, so I would just stop a bit now because we're going to go in there and get them to come in so that we don't overrun completely. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just, just keep going and keep talking. We can come in. Yeah, we'll all go in there. We can just stand and point. Yeah, look. <laughs> yeah, look, yeah, look I think what she's saying is, uh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. By the way, I think this is the most scenic bus stop in the UK. It's nice view of Ben Nevis in the background. It's a bad photo taken with my mobile phone, and it was dark. Ben Nevis. <laughs> oh, is that yours? Are you on next? Yeah, well, yes. Yeah, I'm going to the chair up next time. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for that wonderful session. I quite enjoyed myself. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you great. very much for your yeah. yeah. Sorry, we did one. We did one. In your absence, <laughs> yeah. we did a spontaneous. We did a spontaneous round. Okay, so I'll well. <laughs> we can't have we can't have enough praise right here. Right? So, you don't mind the extra time. Yeah. Huh? You don't mind the extra time. Uh, so, what do we want to do? Do we are we trying to keep to the same time? Uh, no, because I'll just go as quickly as I can. Okay, so we've got to 15.55. Okay, then. That's it. Thank you. Oh, where did the pens go? Over here. Yeah, lot around here. It's not It's not Thank you for So what I need is I need to give these out. Right, come on. Do you want to do that? I say... Yeah. Come on. One of these come in. Please. Please. What? Yeah. Yeah. Go early. Go up. Oh, one for your friends. Thank you. Please come on the back. Well, please come on the back. Can you have a clicker? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, yeah. Any feedback I'm having equally the same problem. Completely hard to refer. Oh, yeah, yes, the people are going to be able to do that. Yes, we keep an eye on the coffee, so you know, Mira had a technical fail in her last session. I, I think I've picked it up as a bug, so bear with me. If this doesn't work, we'll do some old traditional ways of doing things. It's working! Woo! -hoo. Don't worry. Right, ready to roll. I am ready to roll. My so. dinner, folks. My dinner. Hi. That was extremely kind of you. <laughs> I've got, a, I've got a, something I want to share with you, which is about the idea of the fact that there are some benefits in running MOOCs. And if I ever have any problems, because I'm doing some technical stuff, you're going to see pictures of cats. So if you, see, if you see pictures of cats, but I'm looking quite happy, all is well. If you see pictures of cats for a long time, just bear with me. Because I want to do something, because I know it's the end of the day, we might all be a little bit more on the side of leaving rather than staying. So just while I've still got you, we're going to do some really basic warm-ups. So can people do this? Is that something you can do? Good, that's a good one. Can you do it? That's all you need to do. That's the whole exercise. And you'll see why in a second. So let me just get this going. You're going to be talking to one another and you're going to be voting, by the way, just in case that wasn't clear. So let's do this. Right, you might have noticed at lunchtime, and that's why I've got cats because this isn't messy, that I asked for you to go and have a look at the benefits of MOOCs. Now UCL wanted to know, why is everyone MOOCing? What's the value in it? We're not allowed to do it ourselves, but there's got to be some really good reasons, right? And our, 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 our VCs, our vice principals, vice chancellors, whatever, says, um, come on then, we've got some money, but what's the, what's the value of this? So we said, well, you know, we're not going to make you any money off this, you do realise. And I think that was maybe a bit jarring, the idea that MOOCs make you no money. Hence the purpose of this session, it's not about the money. Now, I mean incoming money. You probably have to spend something to get these things going, but you don't get a net return. This is not a business venture. Spend money to make money, accumulate to speculate, that kind of thing. It's different. But there are benefits of MOOCs that are perhaps slightly less tangible, but are certainly worth bearing in mind, and they have a value. But what are they? So we did an exercise, courtesy of the need for our Vice Chancellor, to say, what's the point in all this? And we identified um, 30, nearly or 30 odd um, benefits to MOOCs from digging through all of your reports, <coughs> all of your literature, all the studies that have happened. This is not a very clear format, I just wanted to highlight to you that there was quite a few. What we're going to do is we're going to look at them in subsets, and we're going to look at each subset, and then we're going to vote for the ones that we think, the one that we think is the most important, um, the most valuable, the most meaningful to ourselves. But I want to very quickly run through what they are. I'm afraid if one of them doesn't quite make sense, we, when we're voting you can talk to your neighbour, <coughs> maybe they'll clear it up for you, but it's also very contextual. Modern approach to you might be some very, very, very different to someone else's modern approach. You might be lugging yourself out the 19th century, someone else might be lugging themselves out the 16th century. So we'll see how we go. But this was our first group, a brace around the idea of reputation. MOOCs can boost your, your university, yourself, your academics, your subject, whatever, the reputation of things. And then we're going to vote later. The second subset was about innovation, it was about creating new things, doing new things, discovering new things. Thinking about the idea of this interdisciplinarity on a whole new level with different partner universities or different people working together. Uh, I'm not going to, oh, going a bit too fast. I'm not going to go into each one, just due to time. So, delivery, widening participation, delivering things on whole new platforms we've never used before. Thinking about translation problems. I've got a course, everyone's banding around this idea of 120 countries. There's going to be someone that's probably reached every single possible state, country, republic, whatever in the world. But you're not doing it in their language, so what's the true value of someone studying when English is probably the second or third language to them? But maybe we're going to start to see courses being translated in bulk, and we're starting to see these kinds of benefits that would not be obvious from the outset. The second to last group is about infrastructure, building things internally, building capability, building power, creating meaningful analytics, expanded media capacity. Do we really need kind of strapped helicopters zooming in and creating wonderful panoramics for our videos or can we have wobble camera on our laptop and that's good enough because we've made a hundred of them compared to one but thinking around the idea of infrastructure and the things that we can build in order to enable us and then the last sub group is about student outcomes is this a genuine learning experience you could argue yes or no but thinking about reaching global audiences building communities mixing cohorts together getting the alumni from one MOOC back into the next one and making them feel kind of bringing some energy back in because they've done this before so there's a really there's a lot to go into there uh, and also there's more which is worth bearing in mind there's a lot to go in, into 
we haven't really got the time to explore them all. I have blogged about it, and I was really hoping that that might be the beginning of a conversation, and I really want people to contest all these points. Because if, if we're missing some, fantastic. Today I tried to gather some from you. I got three more, which was providing taster courses for a, break, for a bigger course, so maybe there's a new master's program, and your MOOC is a little sliver of that to, to gain interest, basically. Uh, increasing learner confidence, so maybe you're transitioning into higher education or another form of education. MOOCs are a way of sampling that. Does that work for me, for myself, for my time, for my restrictions in my life? And then finally, citizenship. Bit of a vague concept, but the idea that maybe it makes someone a better person by mixing cultures or new disciplines or whatever. So I'm, I've added those in. If you want to know a lot more, I've written a really long, sorry, mind dump type blog post, and it could all be found on bit.ly forward slash MOOC benefits. For the benefit of the audio, which I haven't been wearing because I forgot. Um, that was bit.ly MOOC benefits. I know, but I'm, I'm thinking of the wider audience. Um, and that's my, me pushing my own blog. No, it's the UCL blog. So, first round of voting. Pick up these little handsets. You can push the buttons one to five. And I want to know a little bit of demographics. I'm not going to take your name. But where do you broadly sit? Are you a Mookie, Mookie maker, a Mookie learner? Maybe you're both. Maybe you're neither. And maybe you don't know. But I've got a hand. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> it's not you. It's... It's not you, it's me. Um, <laughs> we're going to go, right, go nuclear on the backup option. So, do, do, do. I'm using Turning Point 2008, and I think sometimes you probably shouldn't use technology that's so old. But let's see. No response source. Should change to Channel 41. Right, let's try this again. Do, do, do. Backup option. Netin used to run a group about this, and he's just like, <laughs> you fool. <laughs> You're using live technology at the end of a day. Let's just give up and go to the pub. Um, right, let's try that again. Ah, oh, should have pushed the wrong button. Right, so demographics won't work, but let's find out anyway. Are you a maker, a student, you both, you neither, or you don't know? Please push a button, and now it's working. Wonderful. The only problem is I'm going to really struggle to... I'm going to produce a lot of cats in a minute, because I've got to put all this data together. Right, 37. That looks about right. Let's have a look. Hurrah, thank you, computer. Ah, OK, fairly split. I'm glad that so there's no one that doesn't know. I'm very reassured that you're somewhere in the subset. For anyone who wanted the big data conference, it was at the other end of campus, so well done for making it here. Right, can I... Am I allowed to save that knitting? <laughs> you have to clear it, don't you? It just disappears. OK, do you know what? Never mind, let's move on. Right, so this is, this is, this is research gone bad, but guess what? It's all being recorded. So we're going to go head to head with MOOC benefits. Goat on goat. <laughs> The first one, you've got to think. Have a little chat amongst yourselves. We do have a few minutes for each. I don't want to go too fast. Reputation-wise, your big institution, your employer, your provider, yourself, your name, is getting out there in the MOOC world. Let me start this. What's the most important from this list, from this sub-list of six, what's the most important one to you? Seriously think about it. Do you really want to target alumni more than you need to think about marketing? or media, or it is working good, um, or media coverage. Do you want to be on BBC in the sun, as we heard earlier? Or do you want to just like just get out there and just say, University of X is in this, and we're just so cool? We only have one vote. You can only have one vote, but you, that's the last button you push. So what, keep changing your mind. Um, but have a think about it. What really works for you? I think you missed the main one. It's so your BC can talk to other BCs and say you're right. <laughs> that's button seven. <laughs> <laughs> so reputation-wise, what, what truly matters? <laughs> Going to draw to a close. We had 37, now we've got 30. Oh, we're getting there. Good work, 35. I think I'm the last one, so let's do that. Right, close that. Oh, okay, so, see, why am I, am I making a mistake and I'm doing a... F yeah, I am. Oh, crap. <sighs> Knitting. <laughs> Right, that was awful. OK, six answers. <laughs> do it again, quickly. You had your answer. We can do it super quickly. Yeah, yeah we're getting there. Got your patience. Look at that, so much better. <laughs> Forget the demographics. For those who didn't know who you were, never mind. Um, answer C, which is 1.3 outreach. I'm very pleased to see that. That's, that's really encouraging. And then very, very little for B. In fact, so little, no one cares about alumni. <laughs> I'm not sure if your alumni relationships office would be interested to see that, but we've got it all on tape, so we'll get you for that one. 
All right, let's keep going. So that was the one that's meant to work. It doesn't work, so let's go, skip forward. Stupid technology. Now I know how academics feel. It's very hot up here. <laughs> right. I blame the e-learning team. They're so useless. Massively overstaffed. Don't do anything helpful. Innovation. MOOCs are very different. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> Innovation. MOOCs are different. MOOCs don't work. MOOCs definitely work for us, but they didn't work for everyone else. Um, don't lose heart. Keep faith. But innovation means that you've got to be on the cutting edge. Stuff won't always work. But of these, which are the most kind of innovative components that admittedly I've identified is most ringing true to you? Is it about student recruitment? Is it about you know, new ways of recruiting students? Is it about new ways of creating <coughs> online resources? I'm hoping this one will be slightly more interesting. Take a screenshot when you get the answer. What a technologist. Take photos. <laughs> if you want any, when you're ready to take a photo, I'll pose like this. And then we'll have the best one. <laughs> Am I not mistaken? This is all being recorded, Mira. I signed a form. Yeah, it's all being captured. <laughs> Last time I signed a form, I ended up in lots of trouble. This one's meant to be an advantage to me. It depends on the form. It's a zero hours contract. I knew there was something wrong with that contract. <laughs> Right, so we're nearly all voted. I'm going to move on in the interest of time. Let's see what we've got. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, it's nearly, it's nearly time to end the session. So <laughs> this is awful software. I chose to change it to six. I'm so disappointed in myself. <laughs> I'm not doing it again. We're moving on. We're, no, we're moving on. <laughs> Stop voting. <laughs> Give me a second. I am live on uh, BBC Three at 4 a.m. on a Sunday morning as well. It's, it's, it's all on there. Um, because it, I'm not using the slides that are meant to work, it's all getting very clunky. We haven't done delivery. Right, make it six answers. Right, here we go. Right, let's do the whole pitch again. Delivery, MOOCs, blah, blah, blah. Delivery is really important. <laughs> Opening up new expansive methods of delivery. What a fantastic... This is changing education, the campus tsunami. Yeah, sure. Pioneering platforms. <laughs> yeah. But if the numbers go up, we're getting there. <laughs> the fact that we're losing all the data. <laughs> we're losing the data. It's probably being recorded. It's all wrong. This is, this is science. Ben Goldacre would be very unhappy with this. Um, look at that. Neck and neck between B and C. What were B and C? Yeah, one participation. Yeah, good. I'm, I'm really glad of that. But I think there's others in there as well. Maybe we can do this again in a year's time <laughs> successfully and see how we go. Just put it up in survey yeah. Yes. Yeah, right. Never work with live things. <laughs> uh, learn the rules. Six answers. OK. Infrastructure. Calm. Infrastructure is super important, right? Because most of us are using MOOC platforms because they scale. Is that seriously the only reason? Because MOOC numbers are dropping massively. So can we all ditch Coursera, FutureLearn, and edX because they're now not needed? Or have they genuinely offered this frustrating back end that's now become so familiar you like it again? Um, was that a moan? Maybe. Infrastructure. Encouraging open education, effectively service disaggregation, for it, for if you don't understand, basically means we couldn't do it before, so we've maybe outsourced something. So what you couldn't do before was have a platform for hundreds of thousands of people. You outsourced it. You disaggregated your capabilities. That's not such a bad thing. You might have brought in media experts. You might have brought in content editors. You might have brought in any type of thing. Um, talked long enough to get some responses. Well done. Ooh. OK, so there's some clear winners there. D. Pedagogical yeah, experimentation <laughs> and encouraging open education. I, I, got, I think I've got the right audience for these kind of answers as well. <laughs> Can't believe nobody wants to create meaning from analytics, but let's, <laughs> let's, let's move on, not dwell on these things. <laughs> Come on. Last one. Yeah, last button push counts, because this is proper science. Um, student outcomes, so learner experience, if you want to call it something different, different buzzwords. But digital literacies, <coughs> get them used to l learning in online environments or thinking about online communication skills, building international communities, accreditation, micro-credentialing, what the hell are badges? Well, let's throw them in a MOOC and work it out. Um, what's the single best benefit from running MOOCs in the kind of learning experience? I'm not voting, I realise I'm holding it. 28, come on. 
Wake up. We're going to drop in. No, no, drop out. No, we're back in. Shh. It's drop in, not drop out. Come on, have we learned nothing today? Answer A, digital literacies. Fair. That's cool. I like that. I don't think we know what digital literacies really means, but I think, I'm sorry, not a. <laughs> because it's an evolving area. Do you know what? I just. <laughs> no, this is digital capability. This is completely different. Like, me and the technology are just like that. <laughs> that would have made it a lot easier. And do you know what? We've got three from you lot, so I really want to include them because they are just as important. So providing tastes for bigger courses, increasing learner confidence or citizenship. It's the last one. We haven't had any pictures of cats. Oh, one, two, three. Sorry. Yeah. Clockwise. And I'm going to put it on Twitter. There was going to be a major finale. This was going to be the World Cup. I was going to do this whole World Cup leaderboard, drilling down to one major thing. But guess what? That's not going to happen. I've got five minutes. In <laughs> do you want to look at pictures of cats for four and a half minutes? Um, I have a literacy. I'll tell my mum when I go home. Provide taster courses. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm discrediting the data we're collecting. It was meant to be a very valid exercise. Let's see where it goes. Do you know what? We had this wonderful slide that showed all the people that have made courses, and it's going to come up in a second because it won't work. Yeah, the finale, brilliant. Vote your final answer. So it doesn't work. This slide, oh, it's just momentarily, I need, I, quick, I need a cat. Right, OK, hang on. There was supposed to be a slide that shows all your different types of... I've profiled you by whether you're making or in courses or don't care or doing everything. And the profile is just reduced to a cat and another cat and another cat. You know, there's, I had lots of options there for lots of experimentation. I don't have to do that. But I think... Let's hang on the most important thing. I did have a slide of all of them, despite how completely ridiculous the technology was. Guess what? It works at home. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Um, so this was, the major, this was the main list. No cats. Um, this was the main list. And it, I think it's interesting because we've heard a lot about this today, and they've, they've been coming up again and again and again. Hand up. The terminology is not quite right. But I think the idea of just starting to think about this wider picture of, yeah, we're doing it, and other people are experiencing a lot of gains out of this, some may be completely all over this shot. Only 15 might apply to you. But the others could be on the horizon. The others may never come back. Uh, I will share all this. It's already out there on the blog, which I think is somewhere in here. Uh, it's on there. It's all written about. I've tried to justify which each point means, but it's all hidden away. Um, I would welcome critique now and or later. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> Also, you should go to the geocaching event. I think it'll be cool. Oh, I wish was <laughs> You're uh, kidding me. I'll send you any questions. Or... Yeah, go on. Just a couple of minutes. I'm not a turning point reseller. <laughs> but I do believe in it. Are you all shell shocked now? Too many pictures of cats. Is Sorry, I've broken you. Yeah. Sorry, that's not a very conducive image. There we go.